Hello. How's the sound? OK, I cannot see you at all. You are just a blank. Um, so I was happy to give up some time because I talk very quickly anyway. And I'm going to be presenting on some academic scholarship around the blackfish effect. So uh, it, I would say it's dry, but you're all science nerds. So I feel like you're on the same page with me. But it's rhetoric nerds. So um, I'm a professor at Portland State University. And specifically, I'm, I teach writing and rhetoric. And so I was here five years ago to start a research project on the blackfish effect, and more specifically, the role of this community in that work. So then a few things happened in five years, uh, and academics work slowly anyway. So here I am again. And what I'm going to present today is a little bit of the literature review that I've been working on um, regarding blackfish and the effect. So I won't be covering everything, but I will be covering the work that is specific to this, this topic. So, um, so a couple of things. This is just my overview, and I will cruise through it. OK, so I'm looking specifically, this light is really rough. Um, I'm looking specifically at scholarship published in peer-reviewed journals. So there's a lot of great research that is in non-academic sources, and I'm not referring to that. I'm also not referring to chapters in um, academic books. And therefore, there's a lot that I'm not including. But what I am including is specifically articles that have been vetted through the academic peer review process. And therefore, there are 12 from the last 10 years. Um, that might not sound like a lot unless you know how slowly academia works and how cumbersome the peer review process can be. So this is actually uh, a real mark of attention and focus that it takes, you know, for any peer reviewed article, it's probably a two year process from start to finish. So the fact that we have this many, um, and by start to finish, I mean the beginning of review. Um, so the fact that we have this many is a real hallmark, a uh, real mark of the work that you all have accomplished. So this is a QR code. I'm not expecting anyone to want to look at my bibliography, but the QR code leads you to this slide so you can see the full content of these sources. These are the 12 that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. So there are these are the four major themes that I've seen in this collection. The first is obviously analysis of Blackfish, the film itself, its rhetorical strategies, and um, the people who played a role in it. There is a fair amount of analysis of SeaWorld's response, which is not surprising considering how abominable it was. Um, and then, of course, some work on the blackfish effect. And then a lot of emergent theories about what it all means and why it matters. When we think about blackfish, what does it tell us about humans, about human or human orca relationships, and about communication? Again, QR code to give you these sources. So looking at Blackfish, honestly, it was quite interesting to me that there weren't that many pieces that were really focused on the film itself. There were a lot of pieces that focused on the way that the film spurred action, but less on the film. These three do contain a fair amount of analysis of the film and its techniques. The primary findings here, the primary focus has to do with the genre of the nature documentary. And I question whether Blackfish is, in fact, a nature documentary. Um, but that's a point for academic debate. Uh, there's some attention to the centrality of the trainer's role in the documentary itself, although, as I'll go on to tell you, there's no awareness of this community or the background that we all know that story. Um, juxtaposition of sea roles, rhetoric, and reality, which we know is one of the most powerful things going on in that film. And then a fair amount of discussion of the tension between sentimentalism and sensationalism. When we talk about orcas, are we talking about this sentimental idealized view? Is that what Blackfish is representing? And or are we getting into the like voyeurism of death and um, violence that also comes up in the film? Most of these analyses really point to the film's lack of resolution of that tension. Um, and one scholar points out that he considers that a failure. But for the more advanced work that I've been seeing, that's actually become one of the hallmarks of strength for this piece, is that it doesn't try to answer a question that is unanswerable. Um, and instead, it leaves the audience doing that work and that thinking themselves. Then the work on SeaWorld's response, you'll see that these are from strategic communication and technical uh, business journals and public relations. This. I always think about Kim telling me that um, what she considered SeaWorld's PR malpractice, 
which I think we're all pretty aware of, and I won't necessarily belabor that for you. Um, a lot of the research has to do with the fact that they were in denial or underestimating the power of the movement that they were going to be encountering. Uh, they therefore dragged their feet. They were very weak in those initial arguments. Um, and then once they tried to move on to more advanced interactive engagement, they um, also did that very badly. I think all of us remember the AMA fiasco um, and a misunderstanding of the social moment. And I think this was really interesting because it has to do with um, the bigger picture that we'll, I'll address in a moment. Uh, so then a lot of research on the blackfish effect. I want to point out, um, well, Naomi is on here. <laughs> This, this work is obviously incredibly important. This very recent one um, is if you're looking for a contemporary read on the blackfish effect, this piece came out in 2021 and it interviewed a, a variety of people who are in this crowd. And it's actually the first article that pays attention to the bigger picture. Um, and so it gives you a really good set of data regarding the, the effect. So again, some contextualization, some delineation of the fallout, lots of numbers in these, um, and participation of advocacy groups and shifts in public opinion. So these pieces are really focusing on what we know very well, but they are incredibly useful for those of us who do academic work because we're not citing you know, the impact guide or a, a Huffington Post article. We can really speak to uh, you know, the scholarship on this work. And then this is where it gets, I think, really interesting because I'm, this is my area, is what does this mean for our culture? What do we understand about humans and human nature interaction? A lot of the work here has been exploring the tensions of anthropomorphism and anthropocentrism. And you may have noticed there's a title that is anthropomorphic anthropocentrism in Blackfish. Um, I love to teach this piece simply so that I can say it several times to my students. <laughs> What, is, what they're actually doing there is quite interesting. They're looking at how the way in which orcas are anthropomorphized or given human qualities actually reflects what we think about humans, right? So what do we value in orcas and what does that mean about what we value in ourselves? Um, a fair amount about celebrity culture and the way that orcas can become celebrities, uh, not always in a great way. Often this is quite toxic. Um, and then this last piece, the non-human slash more than human communication, which I think is really exciting because it's a newer area in rhetoric studies where I live, um, where we are trying to move beyond this anthropocentric idea of influence and energy and engagement. Um, and the language around that is actually quite challenging because non-human is an othering term. Um, other than human is an othering term. It still puts us at the center. So one of the things that some scholars have been suggesting is that we try more than human as a way to just flip the hierarchy. And so I really love seeing Ken make the comment earlier in, that, in a clip this morning about them being better than us, um, which I think you know, that's, that's a little dangerous, but it's also really useful because we're so often um, given the other version, right? that we're the norm and, and everything else is other. So these are some of the highlights. This is selfishly just what I think is really interesting. So the big thing is the tension between or the, the, the negotiation that SeaWorld had to do given the power of Blackfish, right? The documentary was so well constructed that their counter arguments were very, very poor. And there is this attempt often to sort of reduce Blackfish to this very emotional document when in fact it is obviously, as we know, highly cited, highly evidence-based and incredibly logical. And so therefore, their failure to recognize the strength of that film, but also the way that the customer base is changing. If you'll remember, SeaWorld was like, oh, they're just a bunch of animal rights advocates. As if that was like a slur, right? As if that would mean that nobody cared anymore. Um, and so they were really behind in understanding the change in social norms. And I will say, I teach Blackfish now to college students. And um, 10 years later, they don't always know Blackfish, right? They're not always fully aware of the film, but they know SeaWorld is bad, right? <laughs> like, they don't have any question about that. It's amazing, right? And that, that's an effect that I think is really powerful. It has seeped into the general consciousness. 
Uh, this I think is really interesting as well because it has to do with the awareness that is growing and this is from a recent article, that most recent one from 2021, that um, th this wasn't about the movie. The movie was the tool that resulted from decades of work by some people in this room and people around the world to be changing the conversation around captivity. And so it really again had to do with the appropriate climate, uh, the appropriate <laughs> cultural climate. I'm watching my time. Okay. This is where I saw some limitations. So interestingly, in several of the articles, they very explicitly attribute the blackfish effect to PETA. Um, which, as we know, in the in like the CNN launch, PETA did a lot of work on their Twitter campaigns. But and I, I only know you all, right? You're my informants. But I don't get a lot of sense in this space that PETA is the dominant force here. But that is how it's being represented in the scholarship. In almost every article, when they are referencing other um, the social media activity that Blackfish was responding to, the Sea World was responding to, PETA is seen as the leader of that movement. Um, and as we know, PETA has a, a challenging reputation in some people's perceptions. And therefore, I think it's really interesting and, and a little troubling, perhaps, that this is the association that is happening in academic presses. And then finally, I think, OK, so this is the cool stuff, I think. So this really resonates with what we saw earlier with Ken talking about this and what Jeffrey was just talking about, that there is this movement, including within my field of rhetoric studies, to be talking about non-human communication. Can animals be rhetorical? Um, and you know, there's certainly some questioning about this. There's a lot of complexity to that issue, right? What do we define as rhetoric? What do we define as language? Um, I was saying to my husband earlier that often in the field of rhetoric, we have a hard time defining what it is we study, but we think about the circulation of energy and influence. And I think if we look at this as energy and influence, these animals are very clearly rhetorical. So this is an interesting piece that is trying to make the move towards thinking about not just can animals communicate, but can we listen? Can we hear? Um, and that, to me, is something that's really exciting, especially for the people in this room, because if we think, if we understand that the orcas are communicating, that a variety of animals can be rhetorical in their actions and in their behaviors, can we understand it and can we use it? Not trying to speak for them, but in fact being sort of um, channeling their communication. How can we engage this rhetorical agency on the part of animals in such a way that it advances our own activist work? And immediately made me think, of five years ago when Ken posted this image. And he said, maybe this is her protest. And this, for me, of course, is a rhetorician. I was so excited. Uh, obviously, I apologize for the sad image, but it's, it's so powerful. Because this is like a scientist, right? He's the whale guy. And so people want to say to me, you know, you're, you know, you're a little fluffy in your, in your academic credentials. But when Ken says, these animals are communicating with us, and I think all of us who experience that 17-day trauma I felt communicated to. I felt like an audience. I think a lot of us did. And I think the world started paying attention in different ways. So if we think about orcas as having their own agency and having their own ability to communicate, it com comes down to whether we can listen and whether we can be um, ad uh, advancing their communication. So a couple of things that came out for me, and of course, as a scholar, I'm trying to figure out where I can fit in here. Um, what they've covered really well is Blackfish the film and what strategies it uses, a lot on SeaWorld's mistakes, um, social media's influence. But what they've been sort of missing, and this is exciting for me, is this scene, right? There's very little awareness of the really grassroots local conservation coalitions that I think are really behind the blackfish effect. I think if we can't understand that phenomenon without understanding what's happening in this space on this island. Um, and so that, to me, is, is a, an opening for us to sort of move beyond the PETA narrative into the accessible, local, everyday um, folks with jobs who are still doing this work. 
I think we can think about ORCA's contributions to our activism and our advocacy. And I also think for me, the thing that I have found most exciting about the Blackfish effect is the salmon connection, right? We, you, <laughs> I just like to come on board. Um, being able to draw the connection that this community has between animal welfare, animal rights, anti-captivity, and ecological conservation in the wild is, I think, the for me, it's the power of this because it shows that crossover potential and it keeps the momentum going by continually regenerating that energy. Um, and so I think that's the way, that's where I see my own work going is really helping the academics to understand <laughs> some of this. Um, and that is why I'm always asking you questions and listening so diligently when you speak because you all are my informants and we are going to obviously il illuminate this, uh, the Blackfish effect going forward in the future. And then I'm gonna end, um, as I promised Jim that I would, <laughs> with this reminder. So five years ago when I was here, I interviewed Ken and he said, if we don't breach those dams in the next few years, the Southern resident population is going to go extinct in our lifetime. That was it. It was, I recorded it, it stayed with me. It is something that has really stuck with me. Um, and then last night, Jim said to me, we have, what, two months? <laughs> we have 35 days. And if we don't make this happen in 35 days, it's gonna be another 20 years before we can. And so this morning he asked all of you to put this into your phone and he said Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And I'm just gonna say, why not do it every day? Uh, here's your contact information. This is the last best, most powerful chance that we have to save this population and the entire ecosystem that rely on those salmon. So, um, this is where, for me, the blackfish effect has the most potential, is in its unifying power to bring us to bear on that, uh, on this work. So, that's all. This is your homework. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes if anyone has any questions. I'm gonna move out. Yes, Hayes. I just wanna add on, when you text this, I encourage everybody to when you get that response, there's a link at the top. Typically when you contact the White House, they want your contact information. So that is what that is. And it says, click this link so I can read your message and reply. So please click the link, fill it out if you've ever signed up for White House petition. They've already got the information. They want your info. Yeah. Yeah. So if you want it to count, I can okay. see Okay, don't ignore the link that comes up that asks for your info. Yeah. Yes, oh. Joe, Uncle Joe is gonna be texting you. You can stop it eventually. Yes. Can people from other countries do that? Yes. Yes? Yes. 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 Canada did it. Canada did it. New Zealand did it. There we go. All right, we've got it. We've got an international coalition here. Did, yeah. So I, I, thank you. Well, something that I did not say earlier is that, you know, it's easy to be complacent about the blackfish effect. And a lot of the research, a lot of the scholars are saying like, dang, we did it, right? This, this has changed. But also that data stops around 2018. And as those of you who pay attention know, you know, they said, let's phase out theatrical shows only in San Diego. Let's build these exciting new spaces. That's not happening. Um, so many of the things that SeaWorld promised as a result of the Blackfish effect have been quietly rolled back. And so what the research is not yet showing is the aftermath. Um, I don't think that undoes the public knowledge and the power that that brings, but we don't get to get comfortable that SeaWorld is like, you know, coming around. They're moving to Abu Dhabi. That's where they're going. Oh, yes, they do. Yeah. It is too easy to get complacent there. Yeah. Yep. I just want to add on the phone calls to the White House. There's only an open line Tuesday through Thursday okay. at those times, but they'll take comments at that, those addresses anytime. Yes. Oh, and the tip that I got at some point was mail is great. Phone calls are great. Um, and mail that is specifically postcards is great because they don't have to test them for anthrax. So you can speed up the processing of your comments. Nora.
Why do I come? Oh my goodness, I'm gonna cry a little bit. <laughs> so when I was your age, I wanted to be a marine biologist. That was my dream. Um, and then I became an English professor, uh, which is also a dream. I've got tenure, so life is a, is a dream. Um, but I, when I first came, it was to be a researcher. And as you know, once you become a part of this community, you're not an outsider. I don't feel anymore like I'm studying you all from the outside. It's such an inviting and inclusive and warm community that I felt very quickly, Jeffrey is very good at his job. Um, actually, I suppose you're a very good doctor as well, but you're very <laughs> good at recruitment. Um, I just felt connected. So I'm, I'm deeply passionate about orcas and orca conservation, and I'm excited to think about how I can do work as an academic that continues to feed that. Thank you. That's a good question. Yeah. So I know that you've been looking at academic papers. Do you ever look at things like I was struck, and I don't know if you've seen it, when the first couple of uh, press conferences came out, when the the word was that lo potentially that Lolita would be no, mm -hmm. would be coming home, meaning the mayor of Miami, the other uh, Miami Sea Cram people. Yeah. And listening to the language that they were using was so different than really? the language that the captivity industry uses normally. Mm -hmm. Like they were speaking in the language that we hear here all the time. So Amazing. I'm just wondering if you have done any research on that or noticed it or looked at it or anything like that. I have not, uh, but I will. So uh, Kim was just saying that the rhetoric around uh, this Miami Sea Aquarium's potential release of Tokatai is markedly different from the way that SeaWorld would have been communicating about captivity. And That's so and so now there's a new project for me. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just on Monday I looked down at my TED Talks and there's one called Could an Orca Give a TED Talk by Karen Baker and I think she's out of Portland. Oh. I don't look Baker or pronounce differently. But anyway, it just you know, listening to what you just said and you know, could we be listening, I suspect there are a number of folks here that are studying orca communication and language and things like that. I'm hoping we hear a little bit about that, you know, here this week. Um, but anyway, I just thought that was so interesting. And it wasn't just about orcas. Um, they're using AI to mm -hmm. help understand, you know, just, I guess, studying all these different kinds of animals, uh, mammals. And, and then they're using AI to help them or decipher what it is they're saying. So do you know anything about that? I or don't. Do I don't. To this? This I'm going to. <laughs> and if she's in Portland, I'll go find it. Yeah, I there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Are we on time? Yeah. Um, Heather. Rights of nature is, you know, kind of mm -hmm. new frontier. <laughs> Uh, we're the old 60s Star Trek episode, too, <laughs> episode, but I just wanted to raise that and get your thoughts and also mention that the legal rights for the sale of sea is an initiative that's um, trying to uh, get a state bill that recognizes the inherent rights of the southern residents. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what, 10 or so uh, cities and counties have adopted proclamations recognizing those rights. We had to twist arms here in San Juan County for them to adopt one year. I mean, they were fighting against it and chiseled down the language. But there's um, Arcata, California, this is like, uh, what is today, Wednesday? Tonight. Yeah. To adopt, look at a proclamation. So if anybody can, just go on legal rights to the Sailor Sea and get the link and, and, and talk. But I wanted to say there's 270 letters were submitted to that county in favor and support of it. So I just wanted to let people yeah. know and also get your thoughts on that because it seems to be some intersection. It does. And I think the, the personhood and the rights movements are, are gaining a lot of credibility. Right? When you have people like Ken and you have scholars writing about these things, not that scholars are special, but um, you know, you put a PhD after the name and people listen a little differently. And so there is, I think there's a lot of movement in that area. I don't know um, how those actual law cases are going. I would actually be really curious to hear whether they're working, but I do think that, I mean, the, the tide, pardon me, the tide is turning on what we understand as personhood. And I think that that is something that is, holds a lot of potential for all of us. Yeah, I think 
I think people are perhaps a little more willing to accept that there is a message being sent because I think we all, I think Blackfish, I think Telequa, I think all of these sort of like made it a little more mainstream to think that these orcas are intelligent and that they have something to say. Um, you know, I, I'm wary about the way people are responding to that situation. Because the more that those of us who love it get like memes about like, let's go girls, right? We're all gonna follow the orcas to the revolution. There are plenty of other people who are thinking like, now they're, they're gonna get my, the way my business. But I do, I don't know. It's an interesting question. I hope so. Yeah. Um, I love this, it's fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, going off what Chris just said there, it's the language and the sort of discourse that is quite dominant around those incidents. <clears throat> It reminds me a little of um, the phrase shark infested water, mm -hmm. um, which is very animal centric. Have you, have you done any work on, on the way sort of those kinds of incidents and encounters are reported and conveyed to the, to the public? I have not, but now I have two new studies, so I appreciate that. And my promotion is secured here. Academics work so slowly, but uh, yes. That's, I mean, shark-infested waters is a perfect example of anthropocentrism that is sort of masquerading as objective, yeah. right? It's a really classic one. And so I imagine that the coverage is doing exactly that. Here. Sorry. Yes. No, um, so I just wanted to say, as one of the authors of the Declaration of Cetacean Rights, um, I would just caution that the job is really not done once you put out the declaration. You need to have legal teeth mm -hmm. in the declaration, in the effort. Um, and so I caution that anyone who puts out proclamations and declarations to, to find a way to give some legal teeth to those statements, because otherwise they just sit out there. And it's really important that they be used. Right. Usually, um, and the way to do that is to try to find uh, animal lawyers um, and ecological lawyers and others who are willing to work with you um, to, to try to make it into something that does some work. Right. The, pub the, the shift in public opinion towards personhood respect is not as useful in some ways as the um, precedent set by legal courts. Yeah. That was Dr. Marino, everyone. She knows all about this night. Thank you. <laughs> yeah? Is there anybody here that's worked with Save the Polar Bear or Save the Manatees? Um, we live in Denver, Colorado. We hear that all the time, but never heard about workers. Really? But manatees in Denver? No. <laughs> yeah. In Florida, but we live in Denver. Right. We hear about Save the Eagles. Mm -hmm. We're just now getting eagles in Colorado, but we never hear about the whales. That's interesting. I, this is not a history that I'm fully versed in, but Save the Whales is arguably like the start of the ecological momentum in the United States. Is that accurate? Thank you. <laughs> I got backed up there. Um, so, you know, but I don't want to say, I think what matters is what's going to motivate the local people. And so if what's going to motivate Denver folk is bald eagles and that gets them on board, that's great. Um, although everyone does love whales. So, right. And then, and we don't want them going to the zoos to see them. Yeah, it's tricky. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. oh. Kind of to just continue with that, I was going to say, in your search of going through some of this literature, academic and non-academic, has there been any discussion of kind of that open-endedness that Blackfish had, where they left that dialogue kind of with the viewer, gave them the opportunity to kind of come to their own conclusion? 
Has there been much of a talk of where it go with this interest that we have in Wales? Has there been discussion of ecotourism and any of that research by chance? Because we have this desire to see this. Right, right. right. I mean, I, I think I would have to defer to people who have more expertise in that area since most of my research was coming out of like public relations and the humanities. Um, so I would say there are probably other people who can answer that question better. Um, but it does seem as though all of these are engaging this question of what do we understand about our relationship to nature and how are we able to think about what they're communicating to us and use it. Um, and so whether that, yeah, I feel like I don't have the expertise to answer your question. I wish I did. Thank you. Anyone? Yep. Yeah. One more question. Oh, yeah, I, sure. Sorry. I'm, um, I'm an environmental justice, and I've been an animal activist for a long time, and I know about this patient Bill of Rides in the summer. Could that be applied, if anybody knows this question, because it's something that I've been wondering about, applied to environmental justice, which applies to underserved communities. Mm. I'm also in assessment with the specialty in water and, and wetland delineation. So all of this is like very important to me. So the question is to some degree, how can these conversations about rights and personhood help become a bridge between animal justice and environmental justice movements? Yes. Yeah. It's a great question. Anyone have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Did I say I'm a teacher? <laughs> legal rights of the Sailor Sea is trying to do, okay. is bridge that. Okay. Yeah. I will look that up. Yeah. Well, and I'd be really interested to hear about how legal rights of the Sailor Sea is related to the indigenous populations right. whose ancestral homelands we are occupying, yeah. right? And I think that, to me, is the conversation that needs to be woven into all of these. Right, and because the, I, the Lumi Nation considers Tokatei right, a family member. as a family member. Right then yeah. it does affect them directly 100%. Right. And I think that part of the, maybe the way that the conversation is going in Miami is because of some of the elders and the leaders and stuff that have been there and really put in the time and yeah. effort and been with Tokate every day and yeah. talked to them. Yeah. And I think that's why the, it's changing. I think so too. Thank you. I'm gonna, I think that's probably a really powerful way to end this, which is to remember that, you know, not all, the, the coalitions, the coalitions among all kinds of communities that make this kind of effect lasting are, you know, what we're here for and what make this work so powerful and emotional and rewarding. So thank you so much for uh, being here, and it's a pleasure to see you.